Hey there, welcome to our exam AZ900 Microsoft Azure Fundamentals Online Study Guide. This is episode 2 of 63. Its title is Cloud Computing Vocabulary. My name's Tim Warner, happy to be your instructor. What we're doing is gradually, line item by line item, working our way through the entire objective domain of Microsoft Exam AZ900, Microsoft Azure Fundamentals. And specifically, we're looking at the top-level functional group Understand Cloud Concepts. The objective is describe the benefits and considerations of using cloud services. And then the topics or the skills is really just conceptual understanding of terms like high availability, scalability, elasticity, agility, fault tolerance, and disaster recovery. Those all happen to be in the basic definition of what cloud computing is or attributes of the public cloud. As you see on the right, you can download my worksheet that has the exam objectives all broken out into lines items. The short URL is timw.info forward slash az900. If you don't know what is cloud computing at base, I want you to look at the right side of this slide and I've got the happy cloud. The metaphor of the cloud, we could look at that cloud as a symbol, a metaphor, an abstraction between your business and your local computing infrastructure that's denoted at the bottom of this diagram. And then this globally distributed network of data centers owned by Microsoft and provided by Microsoft. What we've got with cloud computing, the public cloud in particular, is IT services on demand. Compute, storage, networking, and monitoring. And instead of having to tend to that hardware, first of all, to buy and house that hardware, but all of the care and feeding and maintenance happens from the cloud service provider's point of view. That's Microsoft with Azure. There's others. There's Amazon with Amazon Web Services. There's Google with Google Cloud Platform. But in this skill set, we're concerned with Microsoft. With public cloud computing, you pay only for the resources you consume, and the actual consumption happens in Azure data centers. All you're working with in your local environment are the tools to interact with the Azure Resource Manager Application Programming Interface, or API. You could use the web browser in the Azure portal. You could use Azure PowerShell or the Azure Command Line Interface. You can use various software development kits or SDKs for whatever development language your programmers use. Or fundamentally, you can access the REST API directly using HTTP and HTTPS. I want to teach the vocab concepts in the context of Azure architectural diagrams. And I've given you a link to each one of these diagrams, that is, a description page in the Azure documentation that corresponds to the diagram. You can see that in the lower left of each picture. So first we've got high availability. And what this refers to is a cloud application design where you're maximizing service accessibility. Please don't confuse high availability with uptime. Uptime is just the clock time that a server has been online. You could have a server be online, but if there's a problem that prevents it from offering its services, then I would not call that service available, right? So high availability functions very closely with another term called fault tolerance. And that's where you include redundancy or repetition or cloning in your environment to ensure zero downtime. Let me go back. Because your service is highly available doesn't mean it might not completely go down. Specifically, if you look at the top part of this diagram, you've got in our primary Azure region a three-tier web application deployed in Azure Virtual Machines. And notice that we've got high availability at the web tier. We've got three identically configured virtual machines running in an Azure Virtual Network. If one or two of those machines goes offline, our service or our web tier is still available. But we still could have all three of those machines go down or our load balancer in front go down and bring down the entire service. We can minimize the possibility of a service interruption by making sure we've got fault tolerance. And in Azure, you can develop fault tolerance on many levels. In this diagram, the entire environment has been cloned into a second geographical area, a second Azure region. And so here we're able to layer redundancy in terms of our virtual machines and even our entire application environment such that we could survive failures at multiple levels to ensure zero downtime. 
disaster recovery, speaking of which, is what plan you have in place that if there is a service disruption, for instance, in the primary Azure region, if Microsoft has a regional failure or a regional outage, if you've deployed your entire environment into another region, you're still available. You're still highly available because you have a disaster recovery plan in place. For instance, instead of offering the primary region and the secondary region at the same time in what's called an active-active environment, you might direct all of your customers only to the primary region and then fail over to the secondary region if the primary has a problem that knocks it offline. That's disaster recovery, your plan to restore normal operations in the event of a failure or outage. Now let's look at another Azure architecture diagram that shows the same basic idea where you're providing service geo-availability across multiple Azure regions by combining different Azure products together. And at this point, I don't expect you to be able to identify all of these different products, so don't be lost in the weeds. I want you to look at the big picture here because we're concerned with the top-level vocabulary words. First of all, there's scalability. Scalability can be defined vertically, which is normal north-south direction, or horizontally, west-east direction. Now think of that in your mind, and now apply it to a computer. If you have, for instance, an on-premises computer that's just too overburdened, you're going to want to increase its compute power by expanding its random access memory or expanding its CPU. To do that on-premises can be really expensive and take a lot of time. One of the benefits of Azure, or a public cloud service, is that it's like your compute is essentially a dial where if you need more compute, you can issue a single command into Azure and double your VM's compute power. You see what I mean? So scalability works vertically. That's where you say resize a virtual machine or you shift a database to a higher compute tier where it can crunch more data per unit time. Horizontal scale out is where you either manually or Azure can automatically clone some Azure resource. A web app, for instance, you can configure for automatic scale out, such as the web traffic spikes, let's say, in order to accommodate that load and to ensure that your users get a nice experience. You can configure auto scaling rules so that the web application clones to multiple instances and Azure handles spreading the load across those cloned instances automatically. Now, related to scalability is elasticity. Elasticity refers to the ability to dynamically scale out and scale in. In the example I just gave of horizontal scale, configuring your web application to scale out to accommodate larger load periods is going to be potentially expensive. You don't want to scale out and then stay out. Once the traffic goes away, you want Azure to dynamically bring that service and the compute underneath that service back to its original size so that you're saving money and you're not needlessly consuming Azure resources. That's elasticity. Lastly, we have agility. Azure, or any other public cloud service, is a platform to help you develop and deploy your services quickly. Now, service is a generic placeholder. It's going to be your line of business applications. If you're in an active directory shop or if you use software as a service products like Office 365 or Salesforce, well, those are pretty much canned for you, but you might have internally developed web applications that you want to be able to bring to market or bring to production use as quickly as you can, taking into account some of these other cool features of the public cloud. The ability, for instance, to just pull from an unlimited or seemingly unlimited resource pool. I mean, in Azure, when it comes to storage, it's effectively limitless. There are limits, of course, but effectively limitless. You're not running into hard limits quickly like you generally tend to do with an on-premises data center where your compute is relatively fixed. Learning resources, as always, this is really important. The U.S. government body, NIST, has a reference white paper called the Definition of Cloud Computing. Specifically, NIST stands for the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And if you go to timw.info forward slash NIST, you can download that PDF directly. That's a direct download link to the PDF. And in there, you'll want to look at the definitions, the fundamental definitions of cloud computing. And it mentions everything that we've been talking about. 
Secondly, I'd like you to go to Microsoft Learn, and in their Azure Fundamentals Learning Path, there's a module called Principles of Cloud Computing that will expand upon what you learned in this video. The short link to that is timw.info forward slash cc1. Thank you so much for your trust and for your participation. You can find me at Twitter at Tech Trainer Tim. All of my Pluralsight full-length courses are at timw.info forward slash ps. My website is techtrainertim.com. Stay with me. I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Take care.